Welcome to the Agrihood. Carnes Crossroads is a new home community with a farm-to-table lifestyle. Just outside of Charleston, here, community is defined by gathering together and our deep connection to nature. Our future farm and amenities are taking root and blooming into something you've always dreamed of in a fun, healthy, and social environment. Come home to the Agrihood, where you can plant roots and thrive. Learn more at carnescrossroads.com. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. This is Space Time Series 24, Episode 75, full broadcast on the 2nd of July, 2021. Coming up on Space Time, a possible link between the sun's solar cycle and La Nina weather patterns, Betelgeuse's great dimming, and Starliner's next flight test, slated for this month. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study shows a correlation between the end of the sun's 11-year solar cycle and a switch from El Niño to La Niña conditions in the Pacific Ocean. The findings reported in the journal Earth and Space Science suggest that solar variability can drive seasonal weather variability on Earth. If the connection holds up, it could significantly improve the predictability of the largest El Niño and La Niña events, which have a number of serious seasonal climatic effects over land. For example, eastern Australia becomes drier and more drought-prone during an El Niño event, while it becomes wetter during La Niña. And the southern United States tends to be drier and warmer during La Niña, while the northern US tends to be colder and wetter. The 11-year solar cycle involves a regular polarity flip of the sun's magnetic field at solar minimum. The magnetic north pole becomes magnetic south, and the magnetic south pole becomes magnetic north. This coincides with a slow but steady increase in sunspot activity, solar flares and coronal mass ejections on the solar surface, climaxing around solar maximum, about five and a half years after solar minimum. The violent upheaval then gradually dissipates as the sun moves back into solar minimum and the start of the next solar cycle. The appearance and disappearance of sunspots, the outwardly visible signs of solar variability, have been observed by humans for hundreds of years. The waxing and waning of the number of sunspots takes place over approximately 11-year cycles, but the cycles don't have distinct beginnings and endings. And it's this fuzziness in the length of any particular solar cycle that's made it challenging for scientists to match up the 11-year solar cycle with changes happening on Earth. In this new study, researchers rely on what they describe as a more precise 22-year clock of solar activity. The 22-year cycle begins when oppositely charged magnetic bands that wrap around the Sun appear near the Sun's polar latitudes. Over the cycle, these bands migrate towards the equator, causing sunspots to appear as they travel across the mid-latitudes. The cycle ends when the bands meet in the middle, mutually annihilating one another in what the authors call a terminator event and these terminator events provide precise guiding posts for the end of one cycle and the beginning of the next. Researchers then impose these terminator events over sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific dating back to the 1960s. They found that the five terminator events that have occurred between that time and 2010-2011 all coincided with a flip from an El Niño, when Central Eastern Pacific sea surface temperatures are warmer than average, to a La Nina, when central eastern Pacific sea surface temperatures are cooler than average. The end of the most recent solar cycle, which is unfolding now, also coincided with the beginning of a La Nina event. The authors undertook a number of statistical analyses to determine the likelihood of this correlation being just a fluke. They found there was only a 1 in 5,000 chance or less that all five Terminator events included in the study would randomly coincide with a flip in ocean temperatures. 
now that a sixth Terminator event and the corresponding start of a new solar cycle has also coincided with a La Nina event, the chance of a random occurrence is even more remote. While the authors have yet to determine what causes this apparent correlation, they're looking at the influence of the Sun's magnetic field on the amount of cosmic rays that penetrate the inner solar system and ultimately bombard the Earth. However, a robust physical link between cosmic ray variations and climate has yet to be determined. This is space time. Still to come, Betelgeuse's great dimming and Starliner's next test flight slated for this month. All that and more coming up on space time. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. A new study has confirmed that the mysterious sudden dimming of the red supergiant star Betelgeuse in late 2019 and early 2020 was caused by a dusty veil shading the star, which in turn was the result of a drop in stellar surface temperature. The authors found that sometime before the great dimming, the star had ejected a large gas bubble. And then when a patch of the surface cooled down shortly afterwards, that temperature decrease was enough to cause the gas bubble to condense into solid grains of dust. The new findings reported in the journal Nature follow on from earlier studies which have reached similar conclusions. The brightest star in the constellation Orion, Betelgeuse, is a semi-regular variable red supergiant, which represents the scorpion's tail on Orion's shoulder. Located somewhere between 530 and 643 light-years away, Betelgeuse is the ninth brightest star in the night sky, and one of the largest and most luminous stars visible with the unaided eye. Commonly called Betelgeuse these days, its name before centuries of tortured mispronunciations started out as Italiaza, meaning the hand of the big man, the big man being Orion the Hunter. Betelgeuse began its life some 10 million years ago as a spectral type OB blue star. Calculations of Betelgeuse's mass range from slightly under 10 to a little over 20 times that of the Sun, with some 100,000 times the Sun's brightness and around 1,100 times its diameter. Betelgeuse is so big that were it placed where the Sun is at the centre of our solar system, its surface would extend out almost as far as Jupiter, engulfing the orbits of all the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, as well as the main asteroid belt. These days, it's a bloated old star, expected to explode as a core collapse or type 2 supernova any day now, which in astronomical terms could mean a million years from now, or it could mean tomorrow. When it does finally explode, Betelgeuse will temporarily outshine all the other stars in the galaxy, and it should be clearly visible from here on Earth in the middle of the day. The last star seen to go supernova by humans in our galaxy was Tycho's star. That was back in 1572. That was before the invention of the telescope. When Betelgeuse suddenly became visibly darker in late 2019 and early 2020, it had the astronomical community puzzled. It had suddenly, in a very short space of time, gone from being the ninth brightest star in the night sky to being the 20th brightest. In fact, Betelgeuse's dip in brightness was noticeable even with the unaided eye, and that led astronomer Miguel Montagas and colleagues to point the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope, or VLT, in Chile towards it. Their observations revealed that the star was being partially concealed by a cloud of dust, a discovery which solves the mystery of the great dimming. 
an image from December 2019, when compared to an earlier image taken in January of the same year, showed that the stellar surface was significantly darker, especially in the star's southern region. But astronomers weren't sure why. The team continued observing the star during its great dimming event, capturing two other never-before-seen images in January 2020 and March 2020. And by April 2020, the star had returned to its normal brightness. It was a rare occasion when astronomers were able to see the appearance of a star changing in real time on a scale of weeks. Betelgeuse's surface regularly changes as giant bubbles of gas move, shrink and swell within the star. The new research confirms that Betelgeuse's great dimming was not an early sign that the star was heading towards a dramatic and imminent supernova demise. To find out more... Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Professor Fred Watson. The mystery of the dipping of the brightness of Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse or (laughs) Old Geyser or whatever whatever you want to call this particular star, they think they know what's happening here. Indeed they do. And they, in this case, is the European Southern Observatory, whose telescopes are in northern Chile. And in particular, these are the telescopes, the four unit telescopes of the what's called the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, even though it's four. And in fact, it was joined by four more for this as well to link up to make um, a kind of array of telescopes. Yes. So the great dimming, it's sometimes called, of Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse or however you want to pronounce it, uh, which is the the bright star on the shoulder of Orion. And it's a red star. It's a red supergiant star. It dimmed late in 2019 and during Mm. early 2020. And normally when we observe stars, all we see is a point of light. Now, Betelgeuse is one of the few stars that you can actually resolve into a disk with very large telescopes. It's a supergiant, so it's, it's big and it's also only about 500 light years away and that's a long way but still near enough that you can actually resolve its disk but you need specialist equipment and you need facilities like an instrument called sphere on the very large telescope and there's also something called vlti which is the a thing called an interferometer which makes the telescope a little bit like a radio array where you spread dishes over an area and you mimic a much larger telescope and that's how they can operate uh, the VLT. So uh, we now have this series of observations that have been released by uh, scientists using the VLT. I think the lead part of this uh, research has come from Observatoire de Paris, uh, the Paris Observatory, and also one of the institutions in Belgium. So it's a European publication, but it uses a facility that Australian astronomers have access to, courtesy of the, the strategic partnership that we have. So what's happened? Well, we've seen the release of a series of images of Betelgeuse taken over that period when it was dimming and growing brighter. And they show quite clearly that what we're seeing is dust around the star. Dust which has produced a drop in temperature on parts of the surface of Betelgeuse and given us this darkening. And that shows up very clearly in these images. What they do, in some ways, they're reassuring because one of the possibilities for the dimming of Betelgeuse was that it was about to turn into a supernova. Yes. We, we, we know that one day this star will turn into a supernova. It's, it's a candidate for it. But, you know, we're talking about over the next 10,000 to 100,000 years. And we've never seen what happens to a star in the immediately before it explodes as a supernova. And one of the, a lot of the theoretical work that's been done on it suggests that it would dim to start with. So that's Mm. one of the thoughts that maybe we're about to see this star become the brightest object in the sky, perhaps even brighter than the full moon. It would be certainly visible during the day. But it looks as though that's not the case, that what we're seeing is actually dust. Yeah, I, I find, it's funny when you alerted me to the story and I and I went to the website first thing this morning, I read the headline, Mystery of Betelgeuse's Dip in Brightness Solved, and I went, I bet it's dust. <laughs> and that's before I started reading. <laughs> I, uh, went, I yeah. bet it's dust. <laughs> but uh, as I... <laughs> you, should be, was, you should be on but, the uh, team. <laughs> as I read through it... The, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 uh, I also read that um, it may have ejected like a, a giant gas bubble and th- 
that is part of the reason this has happened. Yes, that's, um, that's right. It, is yeah. It, I mean, this you know, this star is big enough to incorporate. The, I think the the orbit of Mars will be inside it if it's where the sun was. Maybe not quite as much as that. It's a it's a giant star. Wow. And and its outer regions are they're barely hanging on, if I can put it that way. And it's cool enough that it makes dust. Basically, this is uh, the carbon and the silicon and things. They actually solidify because it's cool enough to do it for that to happen. So you get clouds of dust. But also, as mm. you say, bubbles of gas, which are part of the normal process of a star's life. The sun does that. There's a zone beneath its visible surface, which we call the convection zone. And it's where bubbles of gas are rising to the surface, but it's much more energetic and much more active in a star like the sun with a surface temperature of about 5,500 degrees. Betelgeuse is much cooler and the energy levels are much lower. So you've just got these giant bubbles of gas like uh, cool teenagers wandering through a city centre. <laughs> What's happening, dude? They just wander, wander through the... the <laughs> through the atmosphere of the star and don't do very much, but they, they do shrink and swell. And so it yeah. suggests exactly as you've said that at some point there was a gas bubble that actually was ejected by the, the star. And when that bubble of gas gets far enough from the star's surface, it cools down enough, as I said a minute ago, that you, you can actually get solid dust condensing from the gas. And that's what, what seems to have happened. There's a nice quote from one of the authors. Yeah. We've directly witnessed the formation of so-called stardust, the dust ex expelled from cool, evolved stars such as the ejection we've just witnessed could go on to become the building blocks of terrestrial planets and life. It's a very nice... Uh Quote. Wow, and that's true. And that, and they'll just start to establish life, and then the thing will go supernova. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But that then uh, it enriches the medium more with with other he heavier elements when you've got a supernova forming. That's where our gold came from. Uh, now it, you said it's five hundred light years away, so it's I guess theoretically possible that it. Um, might have gone supernova 499 <laughs> yes. years ago, and in a year's time, we will see something <clears throat> extraordinary. Yes, that's right. Uh, it's always possible. And mm. um, yeah, that will, be, that will be big news, Betelgeuse turning into supernova. <laughs> it's not um, thought to be a life-threatening event. I mean, you, you know that nearby supernovae irradiate the region around them with, uh, well, gamma rays and as well as uh, neutrinos and things of that sort. And that will all... KFC yeah, boxes. KFC boxes, uh, old V8 cylinder blocks, a whole lot. Yeah, the radiation that would come from Betelgeuse turning into a supernova apparently is not enough to threaten our well-being here on Earth. But it would still be nice to be on the other side of the planet when it happens. Yes, I would hope so, yeah. <clears throat> and it would be visible to the naked eye. I imagine this would be... To be huge. Yeah. Yes, it would. Oh, very bright. If I remember rightly from things I've read before, about maybe half the brightness of a full moon. So it would certainly be visible during the day. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. Still to come, Starliner's next test flight, slated for the end of this month. And America launches a new spy satellite. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Boeing will make a second attempt to undertake an unmanned test flight of its new Starliner spacecraft later this month. The Orbital Test Flight 2 is slated for July the 30th aboard an Atlas V rocket from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The launch has already been postponed several times, the last announced flight date being in April. It follows the near-disastrous first test flight by Starliner back in 2019, during which the spacecraft's mission clock triggered an orbital insertion burn at the wrong time, preventing the Starliner from rendezvousing and docking with the International Space Station as intended. Then, just before re-entry, mission managers discovered another crucial software error. This one incorrectly interpreted the jettison thruster firing sequence needed to safely jettison the spacecraft's service module. Had it not been identified in time, the Starliner capture would have collided with and been destroyed by its service module during the re-entry. Mission managers were able to rectify the problem at the last minute and the capsule eventually landed safely in the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico after two days in space. A subsequent investigation by a joint NASA Boeing independent review team identified some 80 items needing immediate corrective actions by Boeing or dereliction by NASA in its oversight role. 
Boeing is now well behind competitor SpaceX in its attempts to fly astronauts to the International Space Station under NASA's commercial crew program. SpaceX has already flown three crews to the orbiting outpost since May 2020. NASA and Boeing have now completed all the actions recommended by the review team and have finally begun fueling the spacecraft in preparations for launch. If this second unmanned test flight is successful, Boeing intends to launch its first manned crew to the space station before the end of the year. Boeing have built three Starliner spacecraft. One was used on the pad abort test, which returned to Earth only two of its three parachutes and was retired, where the other two Starliners destined for the commercial crew program were each expected to be capable of being reused up to ten times with a six-month refurbishment period between each flight. This is Space Time. Still to come, the US Space Force has successfully launched a new spy satellite. And later in the science report, researchers say there's no evidence supporting claims on the internet that vaccines could alter a person's DNA. All that and more coming up on Space Time. The US Space Force has successfully launched a new spy satellite. The tactically responsive Launch 2 payload was carried aboard a Northrop Grumman Pegasus XL rocket, which was drop launched at 40,000 feet over the Pacific Ocean from the belly of Stargazer, a converted Lockheed L 1011 Tri Star airliner, which had taken off earlier from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The Integrated Space Domain Awareness Technology Demonstration Satellite was successfully placed into a low-Earth orbit by the Pegasus. It'll be used to detect, catalogue and monitor man-made objects in space, from orbiting space junk through to the satellites of potential adversaries. And as this is a military mission, TAC-RL2, as it's being called, its primary payload will likely observe other satellites. Tactically responsive launch is a concept that seeks to introduce speed, agility and flexibility in order to respond to dynamic changes in the space domain or an operational theatre. It's designed to insert or replace assets on orbit much faster than standard timelines in order to meet emerging military needs. Space Launch Delta 30 provided range support for the United States Space Force's tactically responsive Launch 2 mission on Sunday, June 13th from Vandenberg Space Force Base. The launch decision authority for this mission was Colonel Robert Long, Space Launch Delta 30 commander. Space Launch Delta 30 provided launch permission, range safety, area clearing, and weather support for the launch. So the 30th Operation Support Squadron typically provides a wide variety of support to any launch here at the Western Range. Uh, our weather officers provide on-console support by evaluating weather conditions for the rocket launch to make sure that uh, the conditions are safe. We also have intel operators that are on console, uh, making sure that there's uh, no threats to the launch process from any of our adversaries. And we also have our, our system maintenance uh, flight is also on standby to make sure all the equipment, the weather sensors, uh, are up and operational to support the mission. For this specific Pegasus launch, we also add in our air, airfield support. So our airfield team will be here providing services and support to the L-1011 aircraft as well as the air crew to make sure they get off the ground safely and then return safely after the mission is complete. Our weather flight is also then, uh, the challenge for them is to provide weather support at both the launch box area to make sure the weather is safe for the Pegasus rocket to launch, but also providing that, that weather support at the airfield to make sure a safe uh, departure and return for the aircraft and the route in between. So looking at the weather from the airfield out to the launch box and making sure the weather conditions are safe. Was there anything that was actually particularly easy for OSS? So the aspects of the launch support that we do typically, uh, a lot of that is very similar to what we provide for this, uh, besides the challenge of some of the, the extra stuff that we do in addition. The fact that this launch, the launch evolution was actually kind of measured in weeks and not months or years, was that a, uh, a factor for OSS's support? So the fact that this launch had a 21-day call-up uh, versus the typical months standby for a launch that we can plan for, uh, the challenge with that was scheduling, right? Making sure we had the personnel available to support the launch when we didn't really know when it was going to happen. Uh, otherwise, a lot of our processes uh, are about the same, and we're always prepared to support anything Western Range needs us to do. Uh, let's gauge the uh, morale and feelings of the of, uh, OSS team members. 
Sure. Uh, this is a uh, this is something that's kind of it's unique. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a new capability, uh, an emerging capability for Space Force and for the Air Force. So. Uh, how do your people feel about that? Definitely the members of the OSS are excited to be a part of this launch. Uh, I know for a Pegasus launch, this is the first time in eight years they've had a Pegasus launch from here on the Western Range. So that's exciting to do something we don't get to do very often. The TAC RL-2 mission was executed by the Small Launch and Targets Division within the Space and Missile Systems Center's Launch Enterprise, and the payload was sent into orbit using Northrop Grumman's Pegasus XL rocket. This, this is a whole new program for us, and they're operating on a much shorter timeline. So whereas the timeline would normally be you know, years in development for a payload and months of planning to get uh, a launch date set and lead up to that date and actually have a successful mission, the entire timeline for this program was much shorter. This specific mission for TACRL, you know, being part of a demonstration of a brand new capability, and just really exciting to be a part of that as we start a new uh, capability for the Space Force. Mind you, fast for launching a satellite doesn't necessarily mean fast. In this case, a spacecraft that would normally have taken between two and five years to develop and build was built and ready for launch in a record time, but that record time was still 11 months. And then integrating that payload onto the three-stage Pegasus rocket and then mounting that rocket on the aircraft, that took another 21 days. Which I guess just proves that when it comes to space, speed is relative. This is Space Time. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Scientists say there's no evidence supporting claims that mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, such as those produced by Pfizer and Moderna, could alter a person's DNA. Professor Thomas Priest, leader of the RNA biology group at the Australian National University, says the way mRNA vaccines work makes it exceedingly unlikely that this could occur in patients. However, he says that's not to say that after vaccination of billions of people, each harboring trillions of cells, which in turn each contain a human genome, number of such integration events can be predicted to be exactly zero. But he says even if such events did rarely occur, the chances of it having a detrimental effect on an individual are extremely low. The concerns follow that study in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences journal PNAS, which found that very occasionally, patients scored positive for genetic material from SARS-CoV-2 virus long after they stopped being infectious and had recovered from COVID-19. Although SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus that replicates itself without integrating into the DNA of the host genome, the authors hypothesized that these persistent positive cases could be caused by rare events where cells integrated small fragments of viral RNA into their genome. An experiment using cultured human cells that were more likely to permit such an inadvertent integration seemed to support their hypothesis. However, two subsequent studies have presented new evidence that the detection technology used could be to blame for the generation of hybrid human viral sequences during the analysis, rather than events that occurred in the cells. The World Health Organization says more than 8 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 virus, with over 4 million confirmed fatalities and over 180 million people infected since the deadly disease first spread out of Wuhan, China. A new study warns that vitamin D deficiency could impair muscle function due to a reduction in energy production in muscles. The findings, reported in the Journal of Endocrinology, are based on studies comparing diets which either included or lacked vitamin D for three months. Researchers found deficiency in vitamin D resulted in impaired function of muscle mitochondria. That's the cell's powerhouse, which generates energy. And this mitochondrial impairment may have implications for muscle function, performance and recovery. 
The authors say they now want to determine whether the reduction in mitochondrial function could be a cause of age-related loss of skeletal muscle mass and function. New researchers found that an ancient lineage of fish known as coelacanths may live as long as a century, five times longer than scientists had previously thought. Long thought to be extinct, that was until one was discovered in an African fish market, the lobe fin silicants are considered living fossils. Now, a report in the journal Current Biology claims to have found a silicant that's at least 84 years old. The authors also report that the silicant lives its life extremely slowly, not reaching maturity until the age of about 55, and gestating their offspring for at least five years. Earlier studies attempted to age silicanth by directly observing growth rings on the scales which led to the notion that the fish didn't live for much longer than 20 years. But the new study looked at far smaller microscopic growth rings from a larger sample of animals, suggesting that silicanths are actually about five times older than what was previously thought. For years, people were taught that Anglo-Saxons were a group which invaded the British Isles from Germany, long after the Romans had left and before the Vikings started to plunder and pillage. But for decades now, there's been debate between anthropologists as to the actual ethnic origin of the Anglo-Saxons. Were they descendants of immigrants from Central Europe? Were they indigenous to Great Britain? Or were they a combination of both? To try and finally resolve this issue, scientists have been examining human skulls dating back to between 1600 and 2800 years ago from across England and Denmark, comparing their anatomy. Now, a report in the journal PLOS One has found early Anglo-Saxons were between 25 and 33% local British ancestry, increasing to between 50 and 70% in the Middle Ages. The authors say this conflicts with many historical texts and suggests an Anglo-Saxon could be better defined by culture and language rather than genetics. A new study has found that despite all the promises, those herbal weight loss pills don't really work. Researchers from the University of Sydney have undertaken a review of complementary medicines to try and find out just how effective weight loss supplements really are. They discovered an industry running largely unchecked, with over a thousand different types of weight loss supplements being sold across Australia, many of which had never been tested for efficacy. In fact, Tim Minham from Australian Skeptic says just 20% of new listings are checked annually. Herbal weight loss is obviously pretty rife. There's a lot of sort of products out there that are designed to give you the easy fix to solve a weight issue. Everyone wants an easy fix. You know, I don't, I don't want to have to go through exercise and dieting. Just give me a pill. Yes, I like the sound of that. <laughs> I know. Everyone would. Gee, it's a lot easier. I can still sit at my desk and have my hamburgers and milkshakes and things and still lose weight. That'd be fantastic. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And uh, really, sort of, as you're saying, hunger suppressants, uh, things that act like speed and basically put you off your hunger. You could also say cigarettes do the same thing. A lot of people who have cigarettes yeah. don't have a great hunger. And as soon as they stop, they put on weight. So perhaps food is a substitute for cigarettes. But uh, there's all sorts of things that you could suggest, but they're not reliable, they're not effective. And there's a study by Sydney University who was looking at the effectiveness of these herbal treatments, etc. They reckon it was a world first, and they found no, there's no evidence that these things will do any good for you. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. 
That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 